Oh yeah, this is a game-changing project. And it has everything. Machining, woodworking, CNC work, more machining, this. But what is it? Well, for the past eight years, I've been making videos using tripods. And they get the job done, but they also kinda suck. So now I treated myself with a ceiling mounted camera gantry. With this, I can position the camera anywhere in the shop, set up shots that weren't possible before and make significant height changes. All of that in seconds. This is a project you will probably never need, but it had quite some interesting challenges in it. So follow me along with the build solving them. A ceiling mounted camera gantry obviously contains a gantry mounted to the ceiling. But if you look at my ceiling, you will see there's no space for such a thing. So I came up with a different approach, which is using some linear rails and a couple of blocks usually used in CNC machines. These linear rails can take load in every direction except the one they're moving. So I think it should be fine if I just mount one long track in the center of the ceiling and use that as my gantry. But I can't just mount the rails to the ceiling because they need to clear the lights and wiring. So I want to mount them a bit lower to some kind of steel plate. And as it happens, I have a perfectly suitable piece of flat stock for that. Hell no. For several years now, I've had a circular saw blade kicking around capable of cutting solid steel. And I was always keen on trying that. And today, this blade can show what it's made of. It took some getting used to the noise, the pressure and feed you need to apply, but this works amazingly well. This is amazing. Wow, this is fast. And the cut quality is also okay-ish. Maybe I can do better on the next one. But this makes a huge mess. So the next cuts, I think I'll make in this corner where the chips are then more contained. You can't really see anything now, but it's not all that interesting. A good sign though is all the chips are bluish, which means the heat from cutting goes into them and not the part or the blade. I can touch it almost instantly after cutting. And this, is the best cut surface I got. Not spectacular, but fast. Then I find the center and mark the whole locations from there. A perfect task for my newly made magnet vise. Well, never mind. First the M5 threads and then the two through holes. After a quick deburring, I only need to make the rounds with a file. There it's done. All six of them. Then I made a big steel plate, which is basically two of the small ones in one for joining the rails together. But this gave me some trouble. First of all, the stock wasn't straight to begin with, but I could bend it back into shape with some clamps. But then I picked the wrong drill bit size from the tapping set and now have M5 through holes instead of threads. What a bummer. I think this is still usable, I just have to use nuts on the other end now. Okay, we heard that and 20 minutes later I recut threaded holes next to the OPSI. Moving on. Now every plate needs a spacer block from wood or something. I found a perfectly suitable offcut from another project, cut it to size and drilled the holes. By accident I got this perfect match of frame rate and RPM on the drill press, making it seemingly standing still. This looks weird, like just pressing the bit into the wood. And same with the chamfering bit. Recording this was pretty cool. Finally, rounding, uh, I mean chamfering the edges and these pieces are done as well. With all these parts done, it's time for the first assembly. I start by joining the rails end to end with the big steel plate to make a long one. To align the rails, I use one of the blocks, slide that halfway over both rails and tighten the bolts. Now this is by far not the smoothest of transitions and definitely not the intended way of doing that, but for my camera gantry purpose, this should be fine. So far so easy. Now mounting all this to the ceiling. I first measured and marked the ceiling center, drilled one hole for the big steel plate and screwed it down, or rather up. Then I could measure the distance from both ends to the wall 
and rotate the whole thing around the first screw to adjust it parallel to the wall. By the way, I did this whole installation together with my dad. Some nice dad and son shop time. Next is securing the ends. We had a nicely questionable clamping setup to press the plate and spacer against the ceiling. It worked perfectly for starting the holes. And here it's essential for the holes not to wander and be at the exact location. In concrete, I found this works best to start the hole with a regular drill, then switch to the hammer function and then switch to a rotary hammer for the hard work. After securing the ends, we mounted the other steel plates the same way and finally the second center screw. And now this rail is up there for good. Ouch. 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 Also, this ceiling is amazingly straight. I didn't have to change any of the spacer blocks. And so the transition in the middle now is basically flawless. Next is making an aluminum plate to mount the two blocks to. I had some leftover bar stock big enough for this purpose. I just cut off the other project leftovers and cleaned the edge on the table saw. Then marking the hole placement and drill pressing them. You know. And after some more chamfered rounds and deburring, this part can be installed. I have another short but identical rail so I don't have to do this over my head. From there I can slide it onto the long rail and test it out. Nice. Whee! Next I need to make a shaft. Everything else will hang and rotate around this shaft, so I want it relatively beefy and accurate. So it's on to the metal lathe, where I first face the end of some stock, center drill and drill and tap M10 threads. First time I tried power feeding this tap size. Pretty cool, but being a blind hole I finished by hand. I then cut it to rough length, leaving it long enough for proper work holding. The other side gets an extra big center hole drilled, so the life center still makes proper contact after I cut the M8 threads there. Then I chucked the piece for turning the diameter down and marked where to roughly stop. I want the hole length really accurate, so I better check the tailstock alignment by comparing the diameters at both ends. I see two 100th millimeter variation. Not bad, but after a few adjustments I made it much worse and then got it to 5 microns variation and went with that. Then it's a bunch of hogging away material, but before the final passes and measurements I let the part cool down again and then sand it to my required dimension, which I undershot by 1 100th. Bummer. But I can account for that when I turn the bushings that will fit this shaft. So then I could face the shoulder to final length, add chamfers and flip the part around to cut off the extra material and finish up this side as well. And there it is, a shaft. It now gets bolted to the aluminium plate with the blocks, but to better spread the clamping and bending loads this part will see, I also turned a thick washer which goes in between both parts. Let's do it properly, this M10 bolt needs 48 Nm of torque and with that the rail assembly is complete. So moving on with the boom arm assembly. This requires both wooden and machine parts. Let's start with the plywood parts that fit the shaft I just made. I cut the main shape of them with the CNC router cause that gives me the best accuracy for the hole locations and leftover hole down material gets removed with the trim router. All done with unnecessary drawings. Now these pieces receive some bushings that precisely fit the shaft, so back to the lathe where I faced some more stock, drilled out some material with the biggest drill I have and then turned the OD to a press fit in the wood with a little shoulder. I cut it off now, flipped it around in the chuck, faced this side and opened up the ID. I did it like that cause turning a through hole is much easier than a blind hole. When I got closer to dimension I checked the ID with a telescopic bore gauge after every pass and again sand it to final fit. Another reason why I needed the through hole. Oh nice. Some deburring and the part is finished. Of course I made two of them. I pressed them into the wood, dry assembled the rest and inserted the shaft to see if it still fits. 
Rubber bands seem to be the best option for clamping, as they clamp all parts evenly. With regular clamps, the parts shifted ever so slightly, causing the shaft to bind up. That didn't happen with the rubber bands. So then I did the same thing with glue, but using more rubber bands for more clamping pressure. The next day I could remove the rubber bands and test the fit again. All the holes are for reinforcement dowels, which I first drilled to depth and then glued all the dowels in. While that's drying, I can work on the wooden boom arm. I cut a slightly oversized piece from a bigger board, jointed one face and edge and planed it to thickness until it fit the other part. The width I cut on the table saw and then this goes together nicely. So let's take this for a test spin. Perfect. It rotates smoothly and clears everything. Now this boom arm needs some more work. I set the table saw fence to guide the piece for cutting a big tenon with multiple passes. And the other end gets a little wedge cut off. Then I align the hole positions with the existing holes and drill all the way through. Here fits a pin which allows the whole boom arm to pivot a little bit. And a bolt on the bottom lets me adjust that. Take a look. Now this is the neutral position and when here's a lot of weight this arm will flex down a bit and by tightening on this bolt, I can lift it back up. I then made a nicer pin with threaded holes and some more screws will lock the adjusted position of the arm. Next is the vertical part, which will be glued to the tenon. Here I jointed both faces and one edge, then drilled two holes. They will be important in a second. But first I cut the piece in half and planed both boards to thickness until their combined thickness matches the other part. Now I can stick another pin and drill bit through the holes to align them and cut both pieces to length at the same time. With the same technique as before I created the matching joint for the tenon. Pretty cool method to create big precise wood joints. But I actually did this for a different reason, because on the bottom will be another shaft which I'll turn from an M20 bolt that I got for free as leftover material. It's grade 10.9 which means it's pretty tough but shouldn't be a problem for carbide inserts. First I needed to turn off the hex shape so it fits inside the headstock spindle. And I know interrupted cutting isn't the best for carbide inserts, but they are still cutting tools and I need that hex shape removed. Next I flipped it in the chuck to again make a big center hole and drill and tap M8 threads. Then I chucked it with the live center for the main turning. The bolt has some wobble and I first turned the whole length until I got a continuous cut. Then I again marked the length of the accurate section and started turning down the diameter. Due to the threads I couldn't quite reach my initial target diameter, but I managed to get the whole length consistent within 1 100th of a millimeter. Pretty cool. Then I turned the shoulder to find length, added chamfers and turned the other side to the same diameter as the rest. And finally I file a flat on the part for drilling and tapping M6 threads across. Now in an ideal world I could cut a curved channel perfectly matching the shaft. But a trim router cuts a square channel and that also works perfectly fine. I added a second threaded hole in the shaft, transferred the hole positions into the wood and drilled through holes for the mounting screws. Ah. Slotted screws. The best invention ever. Everybody loves them. And now the boom arm is ready to be glued. First one of the joint surfaces which I let dry for an hour, then the rest. Again using the pins for alignment and later I plug the holes with a dowel. This now completes the boom arm assembly. Then I grease the shaft and the bushings, slid it on and secured it with a brass washer and a little cap I turned. Oh yeah. It's taking shape. And despite this smooth movement and the big leverage, it still feels pretty solid here. Also reason why I wanted these close fits up here, because a tiny amount of play up here leverages to a lot of play and movement here. But like this, I'm pretty happy. So now comes the last assembly, the parallelogram arm, which is quite similar to before. I cut all the wooden parts on the CNC router and then again need to turn steel bushings that precisely fit the second shaft, which shouldn't be a problem. First turning the OD to a press fit in the wood, 
then cutting it off and turning the ID to dimensions. However, this time I wanted to try something different. Grinding the ID to size with a Dremel tool. For that to work, I needed to rotate the tool post by a couple degrees, spin the lathe in reverse, scratch the surface, set a couple hundreds cutting depth and here we go. I'm genuinely impressed how well this works, feeding all the way in and all the way out again. After three passes I got this, a slip fit with one one hundredth play. I couldn't have asked for more. I pressed them in and continued with the remaining wooden parts. As you may already guessed, these holes also receive a simple bushing. But this time I had a bit of a production setup. In the first setup I used the tool as a stop, then drilling the hole, finished the end with two light passes, adding a chamfer, cut the piece off and repeat. In the next setup I used a spacer to position the piece in the chuck and finish the second side plus a chamfer. And then I opened up the hole with a boring bar to be the right size for reaming since I don't have the right size drill bit for that. Now why did I use three setups for a simple bushing? Well, I needed 32 of them and they now all get pressed into the remaining wooden parts. These parts have location features machined into them and align the bushings and clamp together like this. The main shaft fits nicely as well as the shoulder bolts. So then the same thing with glue again. Since nothing was binding up with clamps, I didn't need the rubber bands. And this also got some reinforcement dowels. For the parallelogram arms, I bought some square aluminum tubing at rough length. At the table saw, I cleaned the factory edge and then cut all of them to equal lengths. Well, it's better double check the length on the drawing. What the fuck? Each end of the arm pieces will get a reamed hole for then again a bushing and a shoulder bolt to rotate on. And to get this nice and smooth, I got some nylon bushings. But as you can see, these are not precise. Their ID is about three times larger than the shoulder bolts. I won't accept this with the other tolerances of this project. So once again, I'll be making my own bushings. I use some POM round stock I have from a different project and again make some kind of a production setup. Register against the tool, facing, drilling and reaming. Then I insert a precise pin I made to prevent the hole from deforming or collapsing while turning the OD. This stuff is a joy to work with. Beefy cuts to remove material quickly and lighter passes to reach the specific dimensions. And the best part is cutting it off. With the pin back in place, I chucked it the other way to face the shoulder to thickness and chamfer the edge. For a shoulder on the other side of the bushing, I also turned washers from the same material. So I drilled and reamed a deeper hole that fits the OD of the bushings and then cut them off one after the other. To repeatedly drill the holes into the arm tubes, I modified my vice jaw to install an adjustable stop and also pressed some small plastic pieces into the arm tubes, which will help when installing the bushings and keep the square shape over time. So then I drilled and reamed the hole to press in the bushing. And since I made this a slight press fit, the shoulder bolt no longer fits. So I run the smaller reamer through there again and make it a perfect fit again. The other end gets the washer and that's it for the bushings. For clearance and aesthetics, I cut off the corners before I could do the rewarding assembly. So far, so good. It can't support a lot of weight at the moment because I haven't added springs yet, but this feels nice and smooth. There's no play in the joints. I can easily reach the ceiling now and when it's fully extended also the floor. And then I can fold it together nicely into the arm, just like I planned. I quickly made the camera mount from some hardwood, screwed it to the end of the arm assembly and mounted my tripod head. Since I only have one camera, I have to simulate the weight for setting up the springs. 
they get hooked onto some pins, which I forgot to record making, but it was just some more lathe work. One replaces a shoulder bolt, the other mounts to an arm. And with the arm offcuts, I could clamp it at different positions and figure out the right tension to support the weight in every position. This required varying the spring tension and the friction in the joints. With the springs now set up, it can hold the camera weight in the fully contracted position and the fully extended position and also everything in between. So then I marked the pin positions and drilled holes to install them properly. Now I can easily move the camera from one scene to the next and also high up in seconds. Just what I need to install the very important end stops on the rail. An angle bracket with some wood and felt. After that I took everything apart again to bring all pieces to final shape, round over edges and paint it with a very satisfying moment. I quite like how the blue color came out. And now let me show you something you probably wouldn't have guessed. Yeah, I built this thing twice. The workshop has two rooms. And I could do some nice changes and improvements on the second build. I used old bearings on this and this joint, which saved quite a bit of time not having to make the bushings. But with the bearings, it ran so smoothly that it started rotating on its own. So I had to add some friction blocks pressing on the shaft, kind of acting like a brake. Now it works and is fully hidden. The other thing is, when this one is fully contracted, I can't rotate it all the way because it collides with the boom arm up here. Here I slightly change the geometry and will never collide. With only one camera, it's difficult to show or tell you what a game-changing upgrade this project is for me. And you will probably never see it again but it works so well and will be incredibly useful for making new videos. And on top of that, it was a ton of fun making. So until next time, goodbye.